Okay, good afternoon everyone. How many of you are design thinking practitioners here? Nobody? Okay, so I can get away by saying anything now. Okay, there is somebody here who knows, so Prasad will keep me honest. Thanks, thanks Prasad. I need uh, someone to keep me honest here. Okay, so design thinking has been a term that's been uh, going around in the, uh, in the industry for some time now. Uh, and of course, uh, Prasad comes from uh, uh, Infosys, where one of the recent most high profile when Vishal started the new conversations uh, within, within Infosys, it, it kind of became more mainstream. But uh, uh, the, the whole thinking behind design thinking has kind of been going around for some time now, right? So let's uh, spend some time in exploring it. Um, let me kind of uh, roll back a little bit and see how the world was uh, in good old days. Uh, just to compare and contrast so that we are able to uh, understand it a little better, right? Now, if we see, uh, there was a time 100 years back when Henry Ford said, you can have any color of car as long as it is black. Has anyone heard of that one before? So that's what Henry Ford did actually, because he was able to drive the economies of scale to the level that he could, he, when he started and the first uh, Model T was built, it was sold at about $750. But because of the economics of mass scale production, he was able to drive it down over a period of 19 years to about $168. And he was able to do that because of multiple technological innovations, and one of them being, you can have any color of the car as long as it is black. Which, which essentially meant, don't ask me for any customization. Don't ask me for any changes. If you like something, I don't really care because I cannot offer you. I'll offer you only exactly what I can build it in mass scale. So that was the kind of a thinking behind uh, uh, design thinking, uh, behind the, pro the product uh, design there. Of course, there was a time when we, we said, uh, well, you can have any, any telephone as long as it is an AT&T equipment. Has anyone been in telecom sector here? Anyone from telecom? So there is a very famous case that happened in 1964. There was a guy of name Carter in the US, and Carter actually wanted to put his own modem onto AT&T network, which was not allowed by law. So he filed a very famous case known as the Carter, Carter phone case, which actually the court in the US eventually ruled in favor of Carter by saying that AT&T does not own the network really. People are allowed to put any other equipment. So 64 was when people actually got the freedom from, from the monopoly of the old AT&T to really put something up there. But before that, for a long period in time, you literally had no, uh, no such uh, kind of an option available. Closer home, let's see, I mean, these were some of the examples in US. Now let's see closer home, what, what was happening there. Anyone remembers the term license Raj? Right? I was, I was uh, during 80s when my father got the allotment letter for uh, uh, Priya scooter, he was mighty thrilled. There was a five year waiting period and he said, well you are still in school but by the time you finish your education and get to be ready for the job, the turn would have come, we would have got a scooter and that's it, we don't have to worry about anything else in life now. Right? I mean that was the maximum we could see at that point in time. I'm talking of, I think this was in 84 or something. Because those days, the government decided how much, who will make car, who will make scooter, who will make motorcycles, how many they will make, and how much import can they do for some of the raw material there, right? Bajaj, for example, anyone remembers the Hamara Bajaj ad, right? Before that, Bajaj did not even have a marketing department. It did not have an R&D department. Essentially, Whatever they started out with, my, my, my father had a 1962 Vespa, not this one, the original Vespa which she used to sell at that time. And I never saw any difference in any scooter that was sold in India from his 62 model Vespa to whatever was there actually. It was all just a copy and paste of that. So that's the kind of a world that uh, we, we all grew up in. And let's see what was happening there. We essentially were, were in the world of one car our favorite car, right? The most beautiful car uh, in the world, right? So, so we essentially were on one car. We were a one scooter, literally. I mean, yes, give or take. Uh, we, literally, we started seeing some of the other flavors a little later, but then we were by and large one scooter country. We also had the one phone system, ITI, right? Everything had to be ITI till that point in time. So it was all ITI and uh, BSNL kind of a thing there. 
Now let's see now what is the world, how, how, how drastically it has changed now in the last uh, 15, 20 years. 91 was the time when we ran out of money, right? I, I'm sure uh, some of us remember that, right? 91 was the time when we ran out of money. We literally had $400 million left in our coffers. And that's the time we as Indians had to do the most cardinal sin. What is the most cardinal sin for an Indian? To sell the family gold, which is what we had to do, right? Because we ran out of foreign exchange and we said we cannot even pay the, the oil bill for more than a few weeks. So we sold our gold to the Bank of England at that time, right? Manmohan Singh, uh, uh, kind of, Narsimha Rao was the Prime Minister at that time. So let's see how much things have really kind of changed for us as an industry or as a country. From being a one phone monopoly, we have come to the point where we have like tons and tons of these phones. Uh, so there is all kind of options available. From being essentially a one car nation to we have come to the point where you have tons and tons and tons of different models available there. Even toothbrushes, right? There's no such thing as one single type of toothbrush. You have multiple types of uh, things there. Uh, so the challenge for any of us is how do we differentiate? If I am a product developer or if I design and, and deliver a service, how do I differentiate really? Because if I only differentiate on price, and if let's say there are 20 people offering me a certain product, if I'm the 21st guy, and if the only parameter is to compete on price, then by definition my price has to be lower than the first 20 people in the room. Otherwise I cannot survive there. But what happens when you keep consistently underpricing your products? You get Kingfisher, right? You get Kingfisher. So you, one, day, one day it just goes into an implosion mode and then suddenly you are not flying from next day onwards. Right, that kind of a thing happens to you. So how do we really do that and how do we really build a better user experience by offering a differentiated product and services? That is the single biggest question uh, plaguing all of us today. So let me tell you some stories. I'm a storyteller, I like to tell stories, so let me tell you some stories here. Has anyone been in one of those machines, MRI machines? I would, ho I would wish and pray for all of you, not, uh, you don't have to go through that. Because anyone who has been there will tell you that it's one of the most traumatic experiences. It takes about 45, 50 minutes for a complete MRI session. Uh, it is cold, metallic, AC kind of a chamber. Uh, it has a lot of knocking sounds that come actually and people really feel very irritated and, and nervous there. In fact, not just the people, the children even feel much more uh, irritated than that. And what has been found is that 80% of the children, five year old, six year old, need to be sedated just so that we, they, could, they could lie down still there so that we can do an MRI scan on them. So we have to subject them to so much of pain just so that we can help them and save their lives in that process. So that is the biggest problem that was faced, that it scares children. As good an MRI machine is, it saves lives, but it actually scares children. 80% of the children need to be sedated before that. So there is a guy in G Healthcare. Anyone from G Healthcare here or anyone from Healthcare? Anyway, there is a guy uh, in G Healthcare. His name is Doug Dietz. Now what Doug Dietz was doing was once he was going to an MRI scan center and he was, as he was entering, he saw one small six-year-old girl with tears rolling down her cheeks and she was like mortally scared of entering that room. She was looking at that room and she didn't want to enter that room. And that room was MRI scanner. And there were tears literally rolling down her cheeks. And that day, Doug Dietz felt very, very guilty about it. He was a guy who used to build MRIs at uh, GE Healthcare. And he said, we guys are supposed to save lives and help people. But the way we are doing that is not really helping anybody. So there's something wrong in the way we are doing things. So he did something very radical by actually, he could not overnight obviously change. All of these machines cost a million bucks. So there's no way he could have gone in a short period of time and done something. But he actually created some very different uh, uh, kind of thing for them. Now, if you were in position of Doug Deeds, I'll show you in the next slide what Doug Deeds did. But what would you do differently if you knew that the machine has to be there to save lives, but the children are scared of using that machine? How, what would you do that? Any thoughts? Play some music? OK, that's a good start. So that's a way to soothe the down. Uh, the, the anxiety level or, or make sure uh, we do something, right? Any, anyone else? Show some pictures. Uh, yes, that's, that's an option. That's definitely another uh, way of doing that. Uh, anyone else? 
I'll show you what he did. He created a very different ambience within the MRI scanner center. It was not just some cheap stickers that he put all around the MRI machines and he just pasted them. He created what he calls as the adventure series where he actually created a storytelling experience for the children and so much so that this was the technicians had a story to tell. So the child was the hero of the story and he or she would come and they would like, technicians would literally engage them. It was like going into a Disneyland for those the small children there. As a result of that, Doug Deeds was able to do that. He, we were, they were able to reduce the amount of sedation the children had to be given was to 10% only. And the proof of the pudding was when the children who were scared to go there would ask their parents, when can we go there again? That is how it changed the entire experience for them, right? So this is one example of how somebody tried some of different things there. I'll tell you another story. Have you heard of this newspaper, Dainik Bhaskar? Dainik Bhaskar is India's largest selling publishing group. It started in uh, late uh, 50s in, uh, in Madhya Pradesh and then it gradually has gone to different places. Now anybody from uh, uh, publishing industry will tell you when you start a newspaper in another city, you make losses for the first few years. It's very, very red. The account book looks red all over the place. But over a period of time, after three, four, five years, you start be getting in the black. And the reason why you do that is because you spend a lot of time in building the advertiser network, distribution network, what have you. Danik Bhaskar took that as a challenge and they said, we are going to start in every town that we launch our paper, number one on day one. That was unheard of in the industry. And this is a story of 1996 that I'm talking of. So here is how, what they did. When, uh, so this example happened in, uh, uh, in, in Jaipur. Rajasthan Patrika was the leader there, one lakh, uh, copy, one lakh uh, dailies every day. What Danik Bhaskar did was they got about seven, 800 uh, student volunteers whom they picked up from the college and they said, you all come here. And then they trained them into take with a questionnaire. And they sent them back to about two lakh, one lakh to two lakh families in Jaipur. And they asked them, we are Danik Bhaskar, we want to launch a newspaper in Jaipur. What would you like to see in that newspaper? And hundreds and thousands of people gave the feedback, so they learned from all of them, and they came back and told that this is what people have told us. What Danik Bhaskar guys did was they collated all that information, and as in response to that, they built a newspaper, gave to the same seven, 800 student volunteers, sent them to the same houses where they had gone the data from, and told them, we came to you last month, we asked you what kind of a paper you would like to get, we have prepared a newspaper exactly as per what you, are, what you told us. Do you like it? And people who, were, who liked it, they said, and by the way, if you like it, instead of the, the newsstand price of two rupees, I am here to take your order for one rupee 50 paisa for a one year subscription. On 19th of December 1996, Danik Bhaskar launched in Jaipur with 1,77,000 copies on day one. Whereas the market leader was Rajasthan Patrika with only one lakh copies there. So they did something radically different by actually uh, building, the, building the customers as a part of the co-creation process. And in that process, they, they did something very magical. After that, they have repeated this experiment in Indore, in Chandigarh, in multiple other cities. Everywhere, Danik Bhaskar goes as number one newspaper on day one. And they have really, and this has been 20 years. This, is, this didn't happen recently. This is in 96 it happened, actually. So they have really templated the whole idea. I'll tell you another story. Anyone knows who's that guy? The white guy in the, in the picture? He's uh, Jeffrey Archer. So, okay. Next to that kid is my son, actually. He was asking him a question. So when Jeffrey Archer was in Bangalore two years back, uh, uh, my son had his board exam the day after, but he said, no, we have to go and meet him. So we reluctantly, as parents, had no other option because we, we went there. And then my son asked him a question. Uh, he said, what, ha what would happen if you actually, you wrote a novel, and after the novel was published, you realized that the ending was not the best one. Maybe I should have done the ending a little differently. So that was a question my son asked there. I don't know why he asked that, but that's what he asked. And then Jeffrey Archer gave a very interesting response. He said, technically, that is possible that we might actually get a different one, but we, that's not how we write, uh, how I write uh, stories. 
there are actually a lot of stories going on at any point in time. So when he is writing a novel, he has multiple plots that are happening at the same time. It's not that he has fixated on one single thing in the end and he's writing the whole story around it. He's looking at multiple points there and then he's, he's trying to see, he's trying to prune that list and seeing which one really makes sense. Can anyone guess how many stories do you think Jeffrey Archer is thinking at any point in time? Any guess? One? Sorry? Five? 13, 30, 13, 30, whatever. Three zero, okay. So what he said was about 14, 15 stories at any point in time. Now, that is not how we associate creativity and talent and somebody who is in that kind of a creative space to be, right? We don't believe that the people who are creative by nature are the people who are doing a lot of experimentation and pruning it down so that they are kind of narrowing down that to one or two things. We believe that the people who are creative and, and master storytellers like Jeffrey Archer have a divine talent that they are able to just get it right and they just go and write the story. But in reality, it doesn't really ha ha happen that way, right? So that's another story. I'll tell you another story. I'll have three, four more stories and then we will try to come to what am I trying to tell you. Actually, you will tell me what did you learn from there. There is a guy of name Scott Dye. And Scott Dye is actually one of the top doctors knee surgeons in California. And he's about, I think, about 65, 68 year old now. And uh, some years back, he thought, uh, he's so loved by the people. They, they gave him an award, most compassionate doctor, and so on and so forth. But a few years back, he had a question. I help people get rid of their knee pain because I operate on them. But I don't know what a knee pain is to, to people. I only know it as a doctor. I don't know it as somebody who has actually gone through the knee pain. He didn't have any knee problem. His knees were perfectly all right. But he told his friends, can you please operate on my knee? Just so that I can understand a little more about what is the point at which the knee pains, what are the pain centers in the knee. And he told his friend, by the way, I want to get operated without anesthesia. Because with anesthesia, I'm not going to understand where the pain is. So he got himself operated on his perfectly, otherwise perfectly perfect knee, just so that he could get a deeper understanding of the pain. It's not a surprise that Scott Dye is known as such a great doctor. When people give up on their knee problems, they go to Scott Dye. A story from India, from Hyderabad, actually. Uh, it's good we don't have lights, actually, so you can. You can focus on the, on the, on the story. So in, in Hyderabad, they actually said, hey, OK, uh, th there are mostly women uh, uh, in the house who are carrying the water, and they have to go there. And the source of water is the open well. And they are picking up the water from there and coming back, to, uh, bringing back. Now, the open well uh, water is contaminated. So, so that's not really good, because people fall ill uh, 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 sometimes. Uh, and so, so they actually created a new scheme. There was a foundation known as Nandi Foundation. And what Nandi Foundation started doing was they built these water purification centers where, uh, where people can just go and buy clean water. It is much cheaper, very cheap. Of course, it's not free, but it's very cheap. It is very high quality. It's not like the open well kind of a water there. And it's, you, they don't have to walk too much to, the, to get to the open well. It's much more closer in the locality. They thought people would like to get this kind of a thing, but not too many of them were going there. This is what you see, the Nandi Foundation, actually. So this is typical uh, kind of a center where they would do that thing. What they found was that uh, not too many women were coming forward and using that opportunity. Can anyone guess why? Sorry? The line? Uh, well, give and take, they, that was not the is big issue because this, uh, I mean, like, the, only few people there, so they were, uh, because the line was there at the well as well. So uh, it was not that big an issue. Apple to apple comparison, not a big deal. Any other? More expensive, it was expensive compared to the free water from the well, but it was not something which was probably like 10 pesa a liter or some ki such kind of a thing, actually. So it was not something drastically costly for them. They could, uh, that they could not afford at all. So it was not the case in this particular thing. 
uh, so they actually were in the localities in this uh, particular case. Sorry? Social shy was not the reason there. Uh, they, they, that was not something. Chemicals or something? No, they tested it. So water was purified. Contain. So they okay. So you good. You guys are coming to that. So so let me tell you what really happened. What they found was that the the water center had a rule that you could only buy in certain those uh, 10 or 20 gallon kind of containers. Now most of the time, what would I, and you have to understand there are because there are five events that connect up. Unless you connect up the dots, you will not get the story. So what would happen is the the women basically. Uh, had to carry those jerry cans like these which were uh, heavy for them to do. So they were relying on a male member of the family who could use a two-wheeler so that they could sit on the back of the two-wheeler and carry them because they could not carry it on the head. Now in the daytime, they were, all, they were all out working there and by the time they got home, the center was closed. Do you see that? Technologically, there was nothing wrong in that. It was a great solution. Price point was not an issue. Distribution was not an issue. There was a small issue that they did not think from the customer's point of view of is it really helping them? The kind of empathy of what the, what the challenges people are having was not deeply understood. And the moment they understood, they said, well, all you need to do is, and, and then they had this rule that no, you cannot buy smaller quantity of water. So they said, no, I don't need so much of water. But then if I buy so much of water, there's no way for me to carry it back to the home. All they had to do was change the container size, be willing to accept it, and they would solve the problem, which is what they did there, right? So this is another video. I will not show it, but uh, you can watch it. Uh, these decks are uh, on the slide share, so you can watch it. But I want to tell you a, a very interesting story here. Anyone uh, from Kerala here? Have you watched this movie? So this movie had two leads, Mohanlal and Mamuti. Both are in love with Juhi Chawla. One of them has to die. You cannot kill any of them in Kerala, trust me. If you are in northern Kerala, you cannot kill Mamuti. If you are in southern Kerala, you cannot kill Mohanlal. That is the rule of the game. So how are you going to solve this problem? Kill the heroine? <laughs> so they did something very different. They created two versions of this movie. OK, so I'll come to the third one in a moment. They created two versions of the movie. The one that was launched in Northern Kerala, uh, Mohanlal dies. The one that was launched in Southern Kerala, Mamuti dies. And then they had third version in which both of them die, and Shah Rukh Khan is the guy who comes there. But that was never uh, launched. So I don't know this. This is probably the fourth. Did, did, did none of them die, actually? It's like, do we have to choose between either one of them? OK. Okay. Okay. Okay, so that's how they. In between. Okay. 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 So, anyway, so the point I'm making is now many a times, uh, this is not a conventional thinking. The conventional thinking is a one way traffic where it is the, it's the writer or the director of the movie who's supposed to be the source of wisdom, source of idea, source of creativity. And he or she is then writing the story. Audience does not have any role in that, right? Audience is just supposed to be a passive recipient of the of the whole idea. Uh, but he, there was a case where the where the where the creators of this felt, hey, no, there is some other sensitivity at work here because it's not going to be. People don't like it. People don't want that kind of a thing there. So unless I am willing to accept it and make changes upfront, I am not going to get the right product here. So they were willing to change it. Okay. I told you a few stories. What is common in these stories? Do you guys want to help me with that? The end customer, do you want to elaborate on that? What, I mean, they, like, what role are they playing? Are we recognizing them? Or? Yes. So thinking from the end customer's point of view, it's not just our own thing, but we are actually willing to concede that and that they, they have something. Anyone else? Sorry, I'll just. Think differently, not just think from the same uh, mold, but try to find a different, radically different perspective there. Sorry. OK. Different way of thinking. Anyone else? 
finding ground realities and not just saying that, hey, this is what is my perception of the reality, but actually going and listening to people and finding a way to do that is something that uh, they, they were willing to do. Anyone else? Think from end user's point of view, fair enough. Create what sells. So you are trying to understand what customers are looking for and try to kind of tailor it, right? It is not the same thing as you can have any color of car as long as it is, as it is black. You have changed the mental model and you are offering a different uh, product to the people and saying, I hear you. I hear you and I'm willing to change uh, as per your requirements, uh, which is very different from what we were doing before, right? Okay, so if we see what is happening here is, if this was the earlier thought process, this is how we have traditionally solved problems in software industry or any other industry for that matter. We want to know what is 5 plus 5. That is the mental model or the paradigm that we actually use. We use a very fixed mental model. But now suddenly we have this new set of problem solving happening, which is telling not 5 plus 5, what is it? But it's telling how many ways I can get 10. I can get 10 as 2 plus 8. I can get 10 as 8 plus 2. I can get 15 minus 5. There are different ways in which I am looking at it. I am not looking at it in one single right answer. I am looking at what are the n number of ways in which I can go about solving the problem here. So instead of a fixed mental model, I am willing to challenge the assumptions. Instead of entrenched practices, I am asking the questions. Asking the question itself is, 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 is a huge merit that I am looking at. Instead of one right answer, I am willing to look at infinite number of solutions. And that is something which we, at a very high level, uh, call it as design thinking uh, paradigm, right? And let's explore the design thinking paradigm a little more. So if we see, design thinking is not design as a noun, right? Design as a noun is the object that we create. And we say, oh, this product has a great design. For example, this pencil has a great design. It's got a great look and feel. I, I actually get a comfort grip when I write uh, using that. So it's got a great design. That is a different kind of a design. In design, so a lot of people confuse between design and design thinking. Design thinking is not the same as design. That's the first thing we need to, to have a paradigm here. It's much more than the shiny new product that we are building. The second thing is design as a verb is a process of designing certain thing there, right? So we might use, if you use Dan Norman's book or if you use, read some of the other um, design, if you go to NID or NIFT and other schools, then you would learn a lot about design, for example. It is more than the process of designing that we are looking at, right? And then finally, in my view, design thinking is more than thinking. It is actually doing something. It is taking a in, an intangible idea and building a tangible product out of that idea. Now, the, the act of building from intangible to tangible is using a certain series of thinking around that, which is what we call as the design thinking. So if this is not what it is, then what is it? Right? I told you what it is not. Let me explain you what it is. So my perspective is, very simple definition to me is, it is an innovative, people-centric, problem-solving approach. And let me go through each of these uh, things here. It is innovative in the sense that some of you also alluded to that, that we were not looking to uh, look through the same filter that we have been looking at through last 30 years or 40 years. We are willing to change the assumptions. We are willing to change the assumptions and saying, hey, maybe there is an opportunity for us to really do something different here, rather than what we have always done in the past. So people are willing to look at those intersection points and change something. It's highly people-centric. We are not looking, uh, there is a very famous book that was, that was written by a guy of name Alan Cooper. Has anyone heard of the book? The title is, The Inmates Are Running the Asylum. If you have not, please read that book. I think it's, it's one of the most important books written. Because the whole, the, the whole, have you heard of the concept of user personas? The concept of user personas was given by Alan Cooper in this book, The Inmates Are Running the Asylum. And the, and the reason he wrote the book was he felt that we technologists are doing the biggest disservice by creating systems for people who are not technologists. So we guys are very comfortable with technology, but we are not really, we don't understand uh, we, the people for whom we are designing. So that was his uh, perspective. You will, if you don't know Alan Cooper, just search for it. He's probably one of the earliest software visionaries of our industry. So you'll do that. And then the problem solving. The idea is not uh, something that we are doing just for fun of doing it. It's a real problem solving that we are after here, right? So how does it uh, combine all the three? Basically, design thinking is a way in which we bring the people aspect of it. What do people desire? 
what is the desirability component in terms of would I like to have this kind of a solution, would I like this kind of a product or a service. You bring the business part of it by saying what is the viability, are people going to pay for it, is there a market for that kind of a product or a service. Because people might like it, but then they are not willing to pay, there is no market for it and you, you don't quite know how do you sustain that kind of a thing. And finally from a technology point of view, how feasible is the product that we are talking about. So all the three have to come to a sweet spot by applying the, the design thinking paradigm. Now is that a process? There is no process really in that sense, in the sense that we are using to a flowchart way of doing things. So there is no design thinking process, process per se, but if it helps us to get a mental model, this is probably one of the best representations of design thinking that you will come across if you were to search for an image uh, here. Uh, this comes from the Stanford Design School uh, or IDEO. IDEO is the world's greatest design firm. Anyone has heard of IDEO? If, if the brush that, if the paste that you used uh, was a stand-up tube in the morning, today morning, I mean the, the paste that you took from, that was designed by IDEO. The, the first Apple mouse was designed by IDEO. So the, this is a company which has actually been at the forefront of uh, design as a paradigm to basically do that. So what we are doing is, there are five steps you see here, empathy, define, ideate, promote and test. Uh, let me just quickly go over them. Empathy is the, is the first, first and foremost important thing in design thinking. What did Scott Dye do when he decided to get his perfectly fine knee operated upon? He wanted to understand the pain that people go through when they get their knee operated. That is empathy. Now I don't recommend to anybody to get their knee operated just because of that. Apparently in medical science there are a lot of stories of people who have actually done self-examination just to understand and, and really break the limits of uh, medical knowledge. But uh, we don't always have to do. But then it really depends on how people have to do. Um, a, a great example that I like to give is a guy of name Sudhir Venkatesh. Has anyone of this heard of this guy, Sudhir Venkatesh? So uh, he, he's one of the celebrated economists at University of Chicago. And there was a time when he actually found out, uh, uh, one day he was just loitering around in the night and he saw there was a light in a totally rundown building. And he went there and he realized that I'm suddenly in the middle of like dozens and dozens of druggies right now. And then he was asking, why do you guys take drugs? And he didn't realize that his life was literally in danger. And people said, how did you even get there? I mean, he was literally, he would have got shot any point in time. But then he was not happy with that and he started learning more about it. Six years he spent living with those druggies to learn why people take drugs, why they don't do anything better. And the only one single answer he found at the end of that six year research was, there is no other option available to them. They have just not seen any other role model. They have just not seen. Now, he is a celebrated economist, actually. If you search for his work, you will find it. The point is, a lot of people would have probably gone, done some survey monkey, and found the results and told, hey, this is what we have learned. He spent six years to get an empathy. He, been, he won the trust of the people for, from whom he wanted to learn something and make a difference to them. That is empathy. And that is the, the, the most important part of a design thinking process. Define, we need to understand, we need to very focus. Sometimes we go all over the place just to, to do that. Defining the problem and really narrowing it down, framing it properly is, is the next part of it. Ideating is an important part of the whole thing. We don't really settle down at the first idea that comes to our mind. We really keep going through that. So ideation ideally is a divergent process first where you are actually coming out with tons and tons of ideas there. Yesterday any of you were there in the game that I conducted? You remember the creativity game that we did? We came up with a lot of crazy ideas, right? And some of them probably might become uh, cool ideas, right? The agile pen that only writes the user's stories that builds, uh, delivers value to the customer. But what we were doing was a classical divergent thinking where we said we are not going to judge what people come up with, but we will let a free flowing thought process happen where people come up with something radical, something crazy, something new, something that might be of potential value to you, right? That kind of a thinking. And then we apply filters to that and we start converging on, on some of these ideas. When we converge on the ideas, then at that point in time we start prototyping them. Because we need to put something tangible in the hands of people for us to test our hypothesis. Would you like to have? What did Danik Bhaskar do? I don't know what happened here. So what did Danik Bhaskar do when they said, uh, oops, okay. I realized that the, 
it was so they basically went out and they they uh, they tried to prototype they, they tried to converge the ideas in prototype and said hey we heard from all of you what kind of newspaper you would like to get does do you like it so they built a prototype based on what they heard from people right and then you have to you iterate based on certain things and you say hey maybe maybe we have to we don't get it right so the iteration is the last step and then you test it rigorously so these are some of the things that we do as a process i just want to show you one more slide on that uh, just give me a second because uh, it uh, the laptop was not on the battery i didn't realize it sorry about that so prototyping is the way we put something in the hands of people and get the feedback remember prototype is not meant for revenue acceleration a lot of people think that prototype means that i can now start making some money out of it if anything prototype is meant for feedback acceleration the feedback that all the otherwise would have come to you uh, would would not uh, come so you you try to do that and then you test it out uh, there so there is no process process per se if anything i would call it as a very non linear process because even though the specific atomic parts of the process are kind of known but the sequence in which they happen could go all over the place there is no linearity or or there is no sequence really in that thinking just last slide so it's a process on one part but it's also a lot of mindset to me it is more mindset than process the design school stanford design school has actually identified these seven uh, mindset i'll just quickly call out these uh, of them one is show don't tell so you basically if you want to really do something you just show it you don't tell basically let people figure out if they can get it that's what is a good product then so you basically do that focus on human values we talked about all the stories had a common element of human being in that embrace experimentation we are not saying that we we know everything there we have the humility to accept that maybe there are so too many unknowns in that we are willing to take feedback and really learn in that process bias towards action we don't want to settle down by saying fantastic bullet points we actually want to build something tangible that people can touch feel and give feedback on so that's an important part of it craft clarity uh, if if something is is not really looking and sounding uh, simple probably there is some some problem there right simplicity is one of the agile values also we talk about so clarity is an important be mindful of the process as much as we are saying it's a mindset and there is no process process but remember there are some process elements going all over the place converge divergent thinking convergent thinking prototyping ideation testing and so on right and finally radical collaboration uh, we believe that as a team we can solve the problems much better than as one single person alone so these were a few things i just wanted to uh, kind of call out here let me just recap design thinking offers an interesting approach to solving people's problem it's as much as a mindset as a process though not in a process in the traditional sense integrates elements from people as in desirability technology as in feasibility and business as in viability and finally it's specially relevant as we create more and more products and services for real human beings who are the real human beings the people who are outside this room in lean startup customer development we use a phrase from steve blank very often when he says we make assumptions and what do we do to validate the assumptions get out of the building he actually goes on to give that advice he says get out of the building and talk to the real human beings because the people inside this room only have opinions they don't have facts the facts are only outside on the street when you talk to the real people who are likely to use your product or service so go out and talk to them understand what it's going to be i know naresh has given me the time out signal so i'll wrap it down here but if there is one or two really quick question i can take it otherwise i am really uh, done here thanks for listening to this i hope it was of some value to you i'll be happy to take the questions later uh, outside the room but if there's one or two i can probably take it quickly if not okay so a, a lot of companies are beginning to use it of course as a company i think the biggest news that is making is in, in infosys as a culture it's changing actually as a it's see it's it's I, i at this point in time i'm really looking at a culture and a mindset part of it how people start changing it so my aim, if i if i am an expert in c c++ java my aim is not to really push that but do i understand what people really want there i'm sorry okay so that yeah so that could be an example there so there are a lot of i mean i gave some of the examples here for example i mean things like nandi foundation is a, is from india uh, denik jagran is from india for example i i try to give uh, some of these examples uh, 
Uh, if you search for it, you'll get more and more of these examples. So, but people are doing it. Uh, I mean, most of the companies would use a iterative loop in which they are actually going through this thinking pattern to, to do that. So the risk is, uh, again, the, the, the biggest, single biggest risk we are talking about when we do a new to the world product development is building a wrong product. Exactly. So that's the reason why we are saying that we are going to do a lot of these uh, early iterations and prototyping to get the feedback. And there again, we are not really settling down on one single source of truth to really do that. We are building the knowledge from multiple sources and bringing it uh, together. So, right. Right. Possible. Right. Right. So it's possible. Some of these will lead to the dead ends. Uh, not all of them are going to be successful. But look at it this way. If you do not have that feedback loop, they will probably be even grander failures than what they are going to be today. So we might as well fail. That's why the fail fast, fail cheap, fail forward kind of a thinking, which I think will help us in uh, really doing it. Sorry, thanks a lot. I hope you enjoyed it.